One of the things that the pandemic has done as we continue this series of beginning again, one of the things that pandemics has, has done is it's changed the way that we are able to eat, right? For a while we weren't able to go into restaurants and then restaurants start specializing in food that you can take home. One of those experiences gives birth to our sermon today. I had gone to the restaurant and they had just started letting people eat back in, so I decided I was going to eat in the restaurant. As I drive up, I get ready to park, and there is a lady there who comes outside and says, sir, you can't park here. This is a to-go spot. You, you can't park here. She said, this is a loading zone. The people call in and order their food, and I bring it out here and put it in their car, and they go on. You can't park here. That if you plan on staying here a while, this isn't a place for you to be. This is for people who have made an order, who came to pick up what they were expecting, and they got to move on. Can I suggest to you that there are some places in life you can't park? They are just loading zones. You've made preparations, you've put in your order, now you pick up what you ordered, but you can't park here. Because if you make the mistake of parking here, it will waste what you ordered and what you put your preparation in for. If I didn't know better, I think I was preaching. That's what I've come to suggest to you, don't park here. I think that's the word that Paul is sharing in the book of Philippians in that third chapter there, verses 12 through 14, listen to what Paul says when he tells us not to park here. Listen, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Jesus Christ has laid hold of me. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but the one thing that I do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The grass withers, the flowers thereof faded away, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I want to talk about don't park here. Listen, God uses both our successes and our failures to equip us for the next chapter in life's story. This is not the end. There is, there is more. I like this book of Philippians. It's one of my favorite. I think it's the most person, one of the most personal books of Paul. You see a sense of love coming in. And Paul is writing this book, and Paul just gives us some stuff about there are certain places in life where you just can't park. You, you've worked to get here, but this isn't park time. It's neutral time. As a matter of fact, leave the car running because you don't want to stay here too long. You've been working, and I know in your mind you're saying, I put in 12 years for this. And those of you who've got graduate degrees, some of you have put in 14, 15, and some of you met did an incredible job with math. You turned a four-year degree into a six-year experience and many of us can celebrate that. Come on, say amen with me. Some of us who had three-year master's program and we, we wanted to take full advantage of the college, so we turned them into five and six years. A amen. I don't need everybody. I need somebody who can testify. I was in school and I stayed as long as the professors and then they told me they were getting paid for it, so I had to move on. But he's saying, don't park here. When Paul writes this letter to the church at Philippi, he tells them to not park here. He says, I hadn't attained perfection. God caught me to catch something, and I hadn't caught it yet, but here's what I'm going to do. He gives three things, and I just want to share them with you real quickly. I intend to holler a couple of times, and then I'm going to take my seat. Would you like to hear them? I'm glad that you would. The first thing that he says you've got to learn how to do is you've got to learn how to forget your past. 
He says, forgetting those things which are behind. Now, forgetting in the Bible is an interesting word because it does not mean to lose complete memory of it. What forget says in the Bible, when we say how God has forgotten our past and we love to talk about I, I'll forgive and forget, but no, to forget, as a matter of fact, in order to forgive, you got to remember because you got to know what it is you're forgiving. What the term forget means in the Bible, it, it means that I know about it, but I don't allow past experiences to affect my present desires. In other words, even my successes and my failures won't hinder me from doing more for God. It's in the text. You act like you don't believe me. Because Paul says, here's what I've done. I've forgotten my past. When you read chapter 3, Paul gives his resume. In chapter 3, Paul was writing to some people, and they were having an issue with other people being a part of the new faith. They had come out of the Jewish faith. They were becoming Christians. And Paul says he's an apostle. They said, now what gives you the right? Paul said, let me break this down to you. He says to them, and you can read with them when he, when he says it, he he says, I was circumcised the eighth day. That means I'm a true Jew. I did not convert. He says, I am of the stock of Israel from the tribe of Benjamin. When Israel broke up and they had the 12 tribes, when the 10 northern tribes were wiped, wiped out and they were known as Israel, the two southern tribes who were Judah and Benjamin, they were the only two remaining tribes. He said, I'm one of the only two remaining. He said, I kept the law. Paul says, if you want to talk about impressive stuff, as a matter of fact, y'all, when you read, he does seven things that he does. He said, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews concerning the law. I was a lawyer. I wasn't just a lawyer. I was a Pharisee, which meant I had taken it to the next level. I persecuted the church. He lists seven things, which means I was a complete Jew. But watch what Paul says. Paul says, if you want to talk about it, over half the New Testament has my name. I spoke so many languages, many of them fluently. When you want to talk about major ballers in the kingdom, I was a major baller. And then Paul flips that thing and says, I count all of that as dung. Now, dung is an interesting term. As a matter of, term, as a matter of fact, in the Greek, he uses a, a, a word, skubala, which would be, we, we would call it a bad word. Dung is waste, excrement, uh, refuse. See, see me after church, I'll give you another word. Amen. He says it's mess. So Paul says, I got all this degree and that is nothing. Here's what Paul understands. Watch this. Don't miss this. Paul, it's possible to be stagnated by your successes. We understand how we can be paralyzed by our failures because I didn't do it right. I ain't going to try it again. But Paul says there are some people who are stationary in success. They achieve something, and you see them down the road, and they're still there. Those of you who are graduating from high school, you don't know it yet, but some of us are older. We got some folk who we can't see right now. If we see them, we run, because when they see us, they're going to tell us about the touchdown pass they caught in the homecoming 40 years ago. There are some people who spend their whole lives looking back at, back at what they have achieved. There, there, there are sometimes, not, you, you know, I like to play golf, and there are some people you play golf, and uh, whenever you get to that certain hole, they're going to tell you what they did for it. And, and no matter how many times they tell you, it's possible to be paralyzed by your fears, but it's also possible to be stagnated by your successes. The amazing thing about God is that we've still not seen his best work in our lives. Now, you would think if anybody would say, I've seen God do what he does, it would be Paul. But Paul says, that's nothing compared to what God, there is more, there is more. I keep hearing that song, that before me is the best. And don't allow yourself to buy into the world's dynamic that says the best is behind us. Your best is before you. Yes, you've you graduated from high school, you've graduated, and we are excited, but there is so much more. We have expectation in you, and Paul says this one thing. He says, I've forgotten what is behind me. I did good. Paul says, I persecuted the church. I messed up. 
And I refuse to allow my failures to keep me trapped because there are some people who messed up in life. There are some people I, I've known, one of the most tragic stories I've ever known, I did a lady's funeral and, and she, was, she was in her 80s. She had had a child uh, when she was 16 and it, she was unwed and she had lived her life with the bitterness because people had spoken. And even at her funeral, some 60 something years later, she was still hurt by what had happened in her past. Listen, here is what God does with our failures. The Bible says he cast our sins in the sea of forgetfulness. And what God does is when God puts our mistakes in the sea of forgetfulness, he says, no fishing allowed. I wish I had somebody to wave at me. Because you got to learn how to move on. Don't let past failures. You get a reset right now. Some mistakes you made in high school, some stuff, you get a reset. You can push control, alt, delete, and you get a reset right now. You get to start over forgetting. I'm forgetting my past failures. I'm forgetting my past successes because I know that God has another level for me. I'll never forget I was preaching for... Uh, Pastor Eric White there in Austin, and I, got, I had to come back home to Antioch where I was serving. When I checked out of the hotel, I was at the embassy suites, and I went home, took care of my business, checked back in. When I checked back in, the lady gave me the keys. I took the keys she gave me. I went up to my room, went in the bag, and took out the keys. The door wouldn't open. Shook the key, turned the key around. You know how we do. Door still wouldn't open. And so what I did was I went back down and said, ma'am, these keys don't work. She said, did you use them right? And, you know, then your boy's ego kicked in. So said, hold on. I'm, I'm a major prophet. Hello. She said, can I see the keys? I went in the bag, gave her the keys. She said, I'm sorry, Dr. Atch. These are not the keys I gave you this morning. These are the keys you had when you checked out. When you checked in, you were on the fourth floor. When you checked out, you were on the third. I moved you up. I had been moved to another level, and I was trying to open today's doors with yesterday's keys. Forgetting those things which were behind. This whole series, you know, I've been talking about those 64 crayons and how excited I was when I got them because they had to sharpen them. Well, let me tell you the end of that story. When I got to seventh grade and got my supply list, I didn't have the 64 crayons. Because when I went to seventh grade to junior high, I didn't have the same toys that I had. My teacher thought the things that interested me when I was in elementary school ought not keep my mind when I went to junior high school. All I'm trying to tell you is you got to learn how to forget some stuff. Some stuff you got to take off your playlist. You, you won't need them when you go to the next level. Forgetting, Paul says, those things which are behind. Then he says this. He says, this one thing that I do. You got to learn how to forget your past, but you got to learn how to focus on your priorities. Hear that drum beat. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, I'm pressing. This one thing. Paul had a focus. Now, I need to tell you, Paul has an obsession with Jesus Christ. I know in my age we grew up and people were addicted to crack. Paul is addicted to Christ. This whole book of Philippians is about his obsession with Jesus. In Philippians 1, he tells us that Christ is the purpose of his life. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In Philippians 2, he says Christ is the pattern of his life. He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In Philippians 3, he says he's the prize of life. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling. In Philippians 4, he says he is is the power of life that God I'm able to do all things through Christ that strengthens me he says that if you're going to achieve you got to learn how to leave some stuff behind and focus on what's important you got to learn how to get a singleness of vision and one of the things that mess us up is that we're too busy trying to chase after too much stuff you got to learn how to focus I tell people all the time people try to make comparisons with our church and other churches and 
they say, well, what about this church or what about this church or we need to do this. And the one analogy I always use is that nobody turns to a radio station that plays all music. You want to turn to one that plays your music so you know what you're going to get. This one thing that I do. Paul says, I've got a focus and I like what Paul is focused on. Here is what he's focused on, and I'm, I want to shout right here when I think about it. Paul says that I may know him. Paul was determined to know Jesus. I told you, already he started churches everywhere. He's been on missionary journeys. He uses a special word for know. It is to know experientially. He said, I don't want to just read. He said, I don't want to know about him. I want to know him him. And I need to tell you something, my young friends. I used to think it was something that was back home. And I, when I was a boy, they used to taught me a song and I thought it was just for children until I got all, out on my own. And when I got out on my own and life started hitting me with things, I couldn't get to mama and daddy. I could hear that song saying, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he, what do you want to know about him? I'm glad you asked me. He said, I want to know the pain of his suffering. Yeah, I, I like that. Thank you, Josiah, for reminding us that last year was hard, but Paul says, I want to partner with him. I want to know the fellowship. I want to have that in common. I understand that if all I got was rain, then my, I would be a flood. I need some sunshine and some rain. If all I got was sun, I'd be a desert. I don't want to be a marsh or a desert. I want God to balance my rain with my sunshine so I can be a garden for him. He says, I want to know the fellowship of his passion. That there are a lot of us who want to know God's power, but we don't want to know Jesus' pain. He says, I want to know what it's like to suffer with him. I want to know what it's like to suffer for him him because if I suffer for him I can reign with him but watch what he says he says I want to know I want to partner with him in his suffering but I want to know the power of his resurrection here is a shout in this text he says I want to know the power that made Jesus get up I want to know the power that would let somebody even kill you, and that's the worst thing we are afraid of, death. But to say death ain't even the final chapter. That even after death, there's still more to come. And I need to tell you, young friends, that when you experience pain and challenge in life, never get to the point where you think that there is all there is, that the power of God is working in you. Y'all, can I tell you something? It's time out for us being impotent disciples since we've got an omnipotent deity. If God is your daddy, you ought to act like him. You, you ought, that's what Paul says. I want to know power. Y'all, I, I wish I had somebody who could feel this. Like I, I, I wish I could preach it like I'm feeling it and you would feel it. That, that what God is saying is I'm tired of you allowing situations to defeat you. You're going to face some challenges, but don't go in and acting like you've already lost. You need to at least show up for the fight because you got some power. I don't need everybody, but I wish I had somebody in here who say, I got some power to speak over my situations. Power that when I want to quit to keep on going. Power when I don't understand to teach me to just trust him and to wait on him. I've got some power. He says, I've got power. I want to know the fellowship. And y'all, here is what's amazing about God when it comes to us and our problems. When you look at the pandemic, and, and as, as Josiah has rightly said, we, we don't understand. We didn't know why God was doing what God was doing. But let me tell you what God did do. One of my preaching heroes was a man named O.W. Mack. Pastor Mack said he was moving some logs. And while he was moving some logs, he said his son, Dion, wanted to help him to carry the log. Pastor Mack said he knew Dion was too little to carry a whole side by himself. So what he did was he positioned himself in the middle of the log, and he adjusted the load so that Dion would only carry what he could carry. The amazing things about a thing about our pain is God never asked for you to carry the whole load. You got an adjusted load. He, he, oh, okay. My friend A.W. Colbert, who pastors in Galveston, said 
he was helping his daddy carry out the trash. And Culver said as he's carrying out the trash, his daddy got part of it, he got part of it. He said he looked down and saw his shoe had his shoelaces had become untied. And he said he, he bent down to tie up his shoelaces, and when he looked up, his daddy had gone on down the road. He said what he didn't understand is he thought he was carrying it, but his daddy had been carrying the load the whole time. When God doesn't require you to carry the adjusted load, there have been times he's been carrying the whole load and you just didn't know it because he let you hold on. He says, I want to focus on what's important. I'm forgetting my past. I'm focusing on my priority. But he says, I'm forging towards the prize. Listen, listen to this, y'all. This idea, he says, I'm, I'm pressing, it, it, it's, it's, it's an athletic term. You've seen runners, and the one who wins is the one who's at the end, and he strains. Listen to what Paul says about himself. Paul, I mean a big Bible baller, says, I'm not perfect. I haven't attained it. But he says, I'm on stretch. He says that I haven't caught that for which I was apprehended. That oftentimes in Greek races, they didn't run just to the finish line. They would run, and the winner of the race would be the first one who would grab the pole. And what Paul says, that pole was called the victor's pole. Paul says, I haven't caught what God caught me to catch, but I'm still straining to get after. And y'all, that's good news for me. Because sometimes a super Christian like Paul can be intimidating. And for Paul to say, I ain't perfect, but I'm still running. When you find out what's important, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take everything in you and press. There are going to be some times when you're going to feel like giving up. There are going to be some times when you want to quit with life. Just say, God is still working on me. He's, he's perfecting me. And I'm straining to get to the finish line. I'm racing with everything in me. And here is what you have. You have a community. You have a church family that's praying. If you were here today, it's because you have somebody who's been pushing you. An old man told me one time, and it was so simple, yet it was true. He said, if you see a turtle on a fence pole, you know he didn't get there by himself. I can look at you and tell you're not here by yourself. And our expectation of you is not to be perfect, but never to give up straining. I thought, what, what wisdom could I give to these young, bright minds? I came across an ancient philosopher, and he wrote these words. I'll read them to you. So be your name Buxbain or Bixby or Bray, or Mordecai, Alley, Van Allen, O'Shea, you're off to great places. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. I borrow with Dr. Seuss. Your mountain is waiting. Get on your way. Don't park here. The best is yet to come. <laughs>